Texas Revolution in a few days. So anyways, we're going to work our way through the end of Mexican politics in the federal era and then into the coming of the Texas Revolution specifically. About where I left off last time was where I was talking about the uh, the various Masonic parties. And if some of this is a review, so be it. Uh, I don't have the ability to lean back and say, okay, uh, can you give me where it was I last time? What did I say last time? So if I have to repeat a little bit for a few minutes, bear with me. And uh, But most of this will be new material. So uh, as we had last time, I know this is a review, and just as a reminder, the Catholic Church is going to control a lot of power and influence in Mexico because of not only its ability to uh, infl have an influence on the economy with half of the GDP under the control of the Catholic Church, but also because of the lack of sacraments being put out because there are bishops not being appointed to replace retired or uh, moved bishops, and so there's a, a breakdown in the religious cultural order in Mexico in response to the revolution. I think it's fair to say, and a student asked me this question, and I may not have brought it out as well as I could have, but one of the things the Catholic Church was opposed to wasn't just modernity in the sense of democracy, freedom of conscience, uh, and what have you, uh, and again, that is simply pre-Vatican II Catholic dogma and teaching, uh, but it was also, it also looked upon the Masonic Lodge and its dependent bodies as a, a threat uh, as at least a uh, adversary in uh, governance and in dealing with society. So that said, uh, when it comes to the Masonic Lodge, the Catholic Church, uh, not just in Mexico, but through the United States and especially in Europe, the Catholic Church will almost basically make it a, a uh, excommunicable offense, a, certainly a penalty offense, uh, to be a good Catholic or uh, to be a Catholic and a Mason at the same time. Uh, some in, uh, some indications are that uh, simply puts you uh, in the eyes of the church could not be a good Catholic and be a Mason because they were so opposed to each other. And frankly, there were many Masons uh, who never thought very highly of the Catholic Church. And so there's an antagonistic relationship uh, right there between the Catholic Church and the Masonic Lodge. And consider Considering the fact that many of the Mexican political parties take their roots, if not their uh, orders, not orders in the sense of marching orders, but at least their order and, and doctrine from the Masonic philosophies, uh, there is a, re a, a uh, problem right there. But obviously beyond that, the army, which we discussed at length about how many problems the army has as far as its corruption, its absorption of money, playing politics, a lack of civilian control of the army, all those things are going to come and weigh heavily upon uh, the uh, upon uh, Mexico and upon the early days of Mexican history. And of course, waiting for that promised and, for, and delivered Spanish reinvasion attempt in 1829. So you have all those things put together, plus and not least of all, and plus and perhaps it's it's, it's a secondary issue, but it's certainly important. I don't want to make uh, downplay this. Uh, the uh, Criollos and the Peninsularis never really get along, and there is legislation in the late 1820s by the Federalist Yorkino uh, faction, the Yorkino Party, uh, to drive out all Peninsularis out of Mexico and strip them of their land and properly property and send them back to Spain. And then that causes upheaval as well. So that sets the general stage uh, for uh, Mexico in this time period. Well, uh, truth be told that when you talk about Mexico and its uh, governance, there's going to be several factions, or excuse me, factors in the governance of Mexico under the Constitution of 1824. As I said to you last time, it's important to remember that the Constitution of 1824 was a near and dear document to the heart of the Texians. And so ultimately, when we talk about all this politics in Mexico and Texas, and especially interior Mexico, uh, it is important to remember that almost all Texians fall in the camp of the uh, of the, the Yorkino faction. And in fact, as I may have started off on last time with Santana, and I talked about Ricky Henderson and all that baseball analogy, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, Santana, for a good portion of his career, was allied with the Yorkino faction. He was not always a dictator. He was not always somebody who was looking uh, for 
power and aggrandizement in a sense. So uh, you got to remember when you look at Santana's life, it has an arc to it. Uh, and there are parts and times of his life where he's a Yorkino, other times he's a centralist. I mean, kind of, you go through the man's career, it is a rather interesting affair. And I still stand by what I say. If there was only, if there was one thing Santana was after, uh, that was his own power, and it was his own glory. So uh, in that sense, he is true. A mercurial, mercurial man. Uh, a a um, madcap, I, you know, whatever phrase you want to use to describe Santana, that's probably appropriate. Uh, and unfortunately, if you were going to ask Mr. Dinosaur, where can I read about Antonio Lopez de Santana, I can't point you to a good biography of the man. The reality is is that uh, it's an it's a failure of Mexican uh, scholarship. Uh, I, I you know no less of an indictment than that. Uh, there, I, at least in my opinion, others may disagree, but in my opinion, there is not a good a good biography or two out there that I can say, hey, go read this about Antonio Lopez de Santana. Reality is that Santana, uh, the the most recent biography that I've seen on Santana basically came from a historian out of Nebraska uh, who seemed to be nothing more than a Marxist historian who was uh, trying to make Santana into some sort of guy he was not. You read Santana's biography, he did nothing wrong, and then really I think to get a good handle on the man uh, is, is that when you talk about Santana, is is that uh, you're probably just going to have to pick and uh, you pick your way through a whole lot of different general histories, biographies of other individuals, and on from there to get a picture of Santana, because uh, he he is not a cookie cutter. Uh, most of those great men of history are not cookie cutters, and unfortunately, sometimes we as uh, students or we as teachers sometimes reduce them, especially in say movies, into some sort of two dimensional character. Santana is no way two dimensional, but he is influential. And it's maybe about where I left off in the last class. I haven't found, I'm not done with his biography because it's really fascinating. But the reality is with Santana, he may be the best politician the Mexicans had at that time period. And that's saying a whole lot. So, uh, 1824, uh, 25, all the way to 29, is going to be a Mexico dominated, or at least led by, probably dominates too strong of a word, but he's certainly led by Guadalupe Victoria, uh, that uh, rebel uh, who is also a general and who is also now the first president of Mexico. Again, Victoria, not a bad guy, just not George Washington. But in late 1829, excuse me, late 1828, it's time for elections, and Mexico's elections are going to be uh, uh, in the good Federalist form. The reality is in Mexico that the Federalist system, of course, uh, Mexico City is the capital of the country, but the states have a great deal of power and influence throughout the nation. Uh, the Federalists and the Centralists, the, the Yorkinos, the Federalists, and the Escoceses, the Centralists, are going to gain varying degrees of control of the, the legislatures. It's not unlike today where that if you go to tech here in Texas, where you talk about the Republicans control the state legislature, if you were to go up to Massachusetts, you would say, ah, the Democrats control the state legislature of Massachusetts. So it's not unusual in that sense. But under the Constitution of 1824, it is the state legislatures that pick the next president. It's not a direct democracy by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the Yorkinos, in fact, have most of the governorships, but the Escoceses have most of the state assemblies or state legislatures. So in 1829, uh, it is almost a foregone conclusion that the can the Yorkino candidate for governor, uh, excuse me, president, uh, the Yorkino candidate for president, a fellow named Vicente Guerrero, Vicente Guerrero, uh, is going to lose, and. Uh, Gomez Pedraza is running against him. It is a nasty affair. And uh, the Yorkinos, this is another step on the road to Mexico's um, choices and Mexico's, uh, well, it's if, if nations take uh, choices and make choices, and then if we have some sort of free, uh, some sort of will to make a choice here, a choice there, or whatever, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, this is where Mexico does something else wrong, I think, historically. And I think it's, it has legs. I think it has a long-lasting impact upon Mexico. Kind of like when they shot, uh, or excuse me, well, they executed old uh, Itterbeatty. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, after Guadalupe Victoria is largely... Uh, 
I don't want to say calm, but certainly largely orderly uh, presidency, the Yorkinos say we make the conclusion, come to the conclusion, we can't lose. We cannot lose this election in 1828. If we lose this election in 1828, uh, the Escocesis will never come out of power. We will never get back. What are we going to do? And so the Yorkino answer was, we cannot lose this election by any stretch of the imagination. No matter what the Constitution says, no matter what happens, we must force our own candidate, Vicente Guerrero, into the presidency. And in effect, we're going to have another revolution. We're going to have another uh, activity. We're going to try to push our man through. And so uh, the main architect of this is a hero in Texas history, uh, oftentimes held up as a great man, and perhaps he is a very good man in, in, some, in some respects. I don't know, good maybe stretching it, but he's certainly an important character in Texas history, and that is Lorenzo de Zavala. Uh, de Zavala, uh, the intellectual fountainhead of the Yorkino intellectual movement, the government movement, uh, all of the above. Uh, De Zavala at his height of power in 1828, 1829 is going to be not only governor of Mexico, and when I say governor of Mexico I don't mean like governor of the entire country of Mexico, but I mean the state of Mexico. When you talk about the state of Mexico, you're, it's like saying to in the American equivalency, it's, it's not a straight one-to-one -one equivalency, but it's uh, rough, uh, but the equivalent of the, govern, the uh, governor, if you want to say it like this, of the District of Columbia that encircles Washington, uh, the city of Washington, uh, the government district, if you like. The state of Mexico is in that same sort of vein. It encircles the Mexican uh, capital, and it's it's a state unto itself. So, uh, Lorenzo de Zavala is the president of or the governor of that state. And by the way, the governor of the state of Veracruz is none other than Antonio Lopez de Santana. He is a federalist at this point in time. That's important to make note of because sometimes students and, frankly, even historians and even teachers sometimes lose uh, track and it becomes who's on first, what's on second, uh, and, and what have you. But at this point in time, Santana is a good federalist. Uh, he is backing the play of De Zavala. He's backing the play of the Yorkino faction, and they drive Pedraza out, they install Vicente Guerrero, and Guerrero will be president uh, of Mexico for approximately a, a little less than a year. So, we say all that, to, and, and this is probably a good point, where if you want to, I would suggest you might even stop uh, the, the playing of this video uh, and uh, go to Wikipedia. Uh, it's not often you hear a history professor say this, uh, but I, I don't, I'm not going to pull it up and try to put it on the screen or what have you, but what I would suggest you do is go to Wikipedia, and then when you go to Wikipedia, type in uh, heads, uh, presidents of Mexico, or heads of state of Mexico. That might even be the better one. But if you uh, you should come up with this this uh, page of all the different presidents of Mexico, including emperors and committeemen, and it's it's a lengthy list. And what I would like you to do is when you scroll through that, it will probably start with a little committee that precedes Iturbide. Then you'll see Iturbide and his refinements, and then of course then down to uh, Guadalupe Victoria and as you go through it. Several things I want you to notice. One, look for the military uniforms that are on the list. How many of those men in their official portraits are wearing military uniforms? Number two, not only do you have that fact, look at, at how long they last. Look at how long Pedraza lasts, because he'll come back. Look at Guerrero, how long he lasts. Look at how long all these characters last in Mexican presidential history. Uh, it's not long at times. And then you have these interim committees. And it's, it's a full-blown mess. Who's on first, what's on second, that's on third sort of deal. And last but not least, look at how many times within the next, say, from 1824, 23, all the way to about 1860, how many times do you see uh, in Mexico the names keep rotating and rotating and rotating? You'll see Santana. Oh, count how many times Santana sits in the presidency specifically, because it's right around, I think it's 11 times, uh, but you can count it. It might be, uh, it may be a little higher, maybe a tad lower, but it's many times. And, but in addition to that, Pedraza will show up, uh, Musquiz will show up, you'll also see, uh, oh, what's his, Gomez Farias, and, and on down the line, Anastasio Bustamante will be in there several times.
times. I mean, it is just a, it's just almost like a loop that keeps playing again and again and again. Uh, not all these men, uh, some of the men who are also on there will end up getting executed. Some of them, many of them don't. It's, it's a mess. It's a full-blown mess. But uh, in 1828, eight, now you can go ahead and start playing again, I guess, now, after I just you've looked through uh, the, the list and seen what I'm talking about. But in 1828, when the Yorkinos put the foot down and say, we are not going to give up power, we are not going to lose the presidency, they enter into some nasty, they, they really push that genie further out of the bottle. The Pandora's box, to use another analogy, is fully open now, and out comes the nasty omens. What they do, the Yorkinos do, is they don't just protest in the streets. The Yorkinos, especially De Zavala, uh, evidently lose, De Zavala evidently lost his mind for a couple, three days. I, I don't know if it can be so far as to call it a clinical losing of the mind, but it's certainly, uh, he was irrational, erratic, uh, borderline crazy. And so what De Zavala did, what De Zavala did was he had about uh, five or six of his political enemies shot. That's nasty, and that's not good. That's part of that genie coming out of the bottle. That's kind of the Pandora's box or circle. Uh, now the Pandora's box now opening, and that's more shooting your enemies. And again, this is where I would say uh, they depart. Not only to the fact that they throw out a legitimate election that they, the Yorkinos, lost, and they refuse to give up power, they further shoot their enemies. And this is a difference between the United States on the one hand and Mexico on the other. Mexico, by the choice of their leadership, by the actions of their leadership, go down a different path. I alluded to this in the... In, in the lectures on the United States, and I talked I talked about the election of 1828. You remember that election between Jackson and Quincy Adams? That was not pleasant. That was not an easy election. I mean, the the charges we're not going to go back through it again. But no one was saying nice things. They weren't debating the issues and and what have you. So. When you talk about that election, however, Adams and Jackson are clearly enemies. They don't like each other. In fact, the word hate might be better applied here. But you don't see Adams standing in the doorway. You don't see Henry Clay, who was working with Adams. You don't see Henry Clay calling out the, the army, calling out the guard, and denying Jackson the presidency. You don't see that. They may hate each other. They may not even go to the inauguration of Andrew Jackson in 1829. But they don't shoot Jackson. They don't shoot Jackson supporters. It is not violent. And the same can be said more especially, it's probably even more important in 1800, when Jefferson and John Adams, not Quincy Adams, but the daddy, John Adams, they don't like each other. They butt heads consistently. Nasty stuff is said about each other in that election yet. In 1801, when the election is finally settled, uh, Adams graciously and appropriately stands aside, though he is not happy about it, and he will not attend Jefferson's inaugural, but Adams stands aside, peacefully leaves Washington City or Washington, D.C., and then Jefferson is inaugurated president of the United States in peace. That is a different route that the United States took to its credit and Mexico to the dis service of the Yorkinos and the other political elite in the country, they didn't. They had violence. The United States just had nasty words. And it makes a major difference in the history and the trajectory of both countries. Well, now that you've got the presidency, what do you do with it? So Vicente Guerrero is an old revolutionary. Vicente Guerrero is uncouth. Uh, he is kind of crude. He's uh, No one will ever accuse Guerrero of being a high-born man. Uh, in fact, uh, he kind of isn't. Uh, many of uh, the elites, even Lorenzo de Zavala, who himself is not exactly high-born, but Zavala will make fun of Guerrero because Guerrero does not use good Spanish. He does not is not well uh, cultured. Uh, frankly, though, it's important to say this. Guerrero was out in the vineyard laboring. He was fighting in the fields of the revolution, where Zavala, frankly, was not. So it's important, I would say, like that is, is that uh, Guerrero, uh, his his blood uh, could have been spilt. His uh, reputation and his life was on the line. And so Guerrero does have that credibility going for him. He is a hero of the Mexican Revolution. He's not the hero, but a hero of the Mexican Revolution. So that's to his credit and to uh, his uh, stature. And that's what made him a viable candidate for the presidency in 1828-29 now. So now Guerrero is in. 
what do you do with it? It's now that you've got it. And in a sense, it's a little bit like, um, it's kind of like the old dog. I, I've used this expression before in class, but it's kind of like the old dog uh, that uh, had chased after the car for so long, but now the dog has the car. You ever stop to let a dog catch the car, the, and then the dog looks at you like, what do I do next? Guerrero, in a sense, is kind of that way. But uh, so perhaps some of the criticism is justified, but it also erodes at the any authority that Guerrero may have had when Lorenzo de Zavala privately and in sometimes case some cases publicly mocks his boss and his party's leader. Zavala is also going to be neck deep in uh, the new government in 1829. This, in a sense, is the high tide of the Yorkinos. Zavala does not, and this is a real mistake of the Mexican system, Zavala does not give up the governorship of Mexico, that state of Mexico. Zavala doesn't give that up, and not only on top of that, Zavala is going to also take on the Secretary of, Sta of uh, the Treasury slot. He's a sec effectively the money man. Zavala is effectively the money man of the uh, rebel, of the government. And when I talked about earlier in, the, in a le previous lecture about how little money Mexico had and how it cost so much more to get a marriage license out of Mexico than it did to get a house in Mexico, that's what I'm really referring to. It's really this time right here, 29, is the Mexican government is completely out of cash. And then at the most propitious moment, uh, the a really a precipice moment, if you like, for the Federalists in Mexico, the Spanish invade Mexico. The Spanish invade Mexico, and the Spanish will lead land rather at Tampico. Excuse me a second, get some coffee. As you can tell, I'm not in the house. I'm in my office today at the here at Blinn. Well, anyways, so in the summer of 1829. The Mexican government is now under assault and siege by the former masters, the Spanish. Uh, you'll have paranoia in the streets. You'll have paranoia in the government. You've already had murder and shootings and such uh, with old uh, uh, with old days Zavala. And Zavala's trying to hold the money together while Guerrero is the president. Now, ordinarily, and even at the beginning of this uh, invasion by the Spanish, ordinarily a nation that has an old general in charge, a hero general in a sense, with uh, with Guerrero, the uh, country would be ecstatic. They'd be like, hallelujah. Hallelujah! Thank you for having a uh, for having this general in place. It would be like us being at war with the old Ruskies, the the Soviet Union in the Cold War, and having Dwight Eisenhower as the president. Which, of course, we did have Dwight Eisenhower as president. We didn't have a war with uh, the Ruskies, though. Russians. So, uh, because. Ike was a hero in World War II, there would be the assumption that he would be able to put it and pull it all together. He knew what he was doing and be able to save the nation, lead the nation in the time of maximum peril. And in a sense, that's what's thinking of with Guerrero. Well, the problem with the Mexican army is uh, several fold. Uh, we've talked about the fact that uh, the Mexican army has rank corruption. Uh, it's bad. It is bad. The uh, Mexican army has not really upgraded. The Mexican army has not really, oh, how shall I put it, it's not modernized very much in the interim period from the end of the revolution to the reinvasion by Spain in 29. There are some improvements, I grant you, but it's uh, overall, it's that business about gunpowder, it's that business about corruption, old Spanish drill manuals that needed to be thrown out with yesterday's uh, bread. Uh, they kept them. So the Mexican army is large. It soaks up a lot of money, but it's frankly not very good. The soldados, if trained properly and led properly, could have been very good soldados, and some of them, frankly, were decent. Uh, but uh, the Mexican army is not capable of meeting the Spaniards at the coast and then driving the Spaniards back into the ocean and defeating them. Well, in the invasion at Tampico, which is on the Gulf Coast of Mexico, up from Veracruz, at the invasion of Tampico there in the summer of 1829, the Mexican army has to make a strategic calculation. Well, and, of course, President Guerrero's involved in it, Zavala's involved with it, too. But the strategic calculation is this. How do we drive the invader out, but how do we do it if we can't meet him on the battlefield, meet him at the beaches, and shove them out? Can we even meet him in battle? 
And the answer basically comes back, well, probably not. Uh, we don't trust the men. There, there are these issues. Uh, what are we going to do? Enter into the equation Antonio Lopez de Santana. This is his golden moment. This is his star. This is his opportunity to really make a name for himself, and he seizes it. This is where Santana goes from being a junior or uh, upper, perhaps a low-level uh, senior officer, to being a hero of Mexico. It's the transformation of a secondary character in Mexican history to being one of the primary characters in 19th century Mexican history, uh, that being Santana, and is here at Tampico. He's going to he's going to repel the invasion, and he does what's very wise and very smart, uh, militarily militarily at least. Politically, it was bad, but militarily, it's a wise thing to do, because in uh, if you can't beat him on the battlefield, you cannot take a crushing defeat with a fragile army. So. What Santana does, knowing the territory, knowing the people, knowing what goes on in the summertime in Mexico far better than the Spaniards do, is is that he he Santana and other generals who were with him with their with their uh, cadres, the fact of the matter is is that uh, Santana is satisfied to let the Spaniards take Tampico and then hold them in Tampico. And that's an important thing. You let them take Tampico, which is a coastal city. It's like saying, okay, you can have Corpus Christi, but you can't go beyond Corpus Christi. It's like saying you have you can have Mobile, Alabama, but you can't get into the interior of Alabama. Well, we're going to hold the Spaniards on the coast. We're going to pin them on the coast. And frankly, the Spaniard invade, invading force is not strong enough to break out. They'll try, but they can't do it. And if we hold them on the coast, and we hold them long enough during the summertime, especially as the summer drags on, we've got uh, nature on our side. Uh, you know as well as I do, especially if you grew up down around Galveston, maybe League City or Deer Park, if you grew up down at Corpus or along the coast, maybe you just went vacationing during a wet year on the coast, and you decided, well, I need to do some, uh, I, you know, I want to go uh, uh, do some fishing around the salt grasses and see if I can catch myself a red or whatever, and it's been wet and it's rainy, kind of like it's been in the last few days, around last month or so around here, you know as well as I do, that is a potential for mosquito heaven. I mean, the mosquitoes are just thanking you for showing up so they can suck your blood. It's no different down there. No different. In Texas and in the up in the Gulf Coast of the United States, they call it uh, the black vomit. Others will call it yellow knife. Texians have, and most Americans have called it yellow fever, and it's mosquito born. The Mexicans, they have their own version of the name, and it's uh, it's a variation of what it does. It's called vomito. Vomito is just like the word, the English word vomit with an O at the end. Vomito. Santana shrewdly says, let the, let the Spaniards stew in that malarial, that yellow fever infested swamp that is Tampico. If you survive yellow fever, you don't get it twice, basically. But many of the Spanish invading force, they don't have any resistance to yellow fever. And 1829 was a bad enough year that it caused the, uh, the Spaniards to get sick and to die. And if I hadn't said it before, vomito or yellow fever or yellow jack, as it's sometimes also uh, called, uh, yellow fever, what it does is create, gives you high temperature in about five days, especially if it's uh, killing, and, and it was down there that year. Uh, what it'll do is you'll get sick for about three days, feel better after one, a high fever all the way through, and then that second part is when you start to throw up, and you're throwing up black coagulated blood chunkages out of your lungs. Gruesome, gruesome and grisly thought, but that's I want to convey that to you because this is not just uh, you know a little upset tummy from uh, some sort of water burger or uh, some sort of no water burger doesn't have bad food I grant you that but you don't get food poisoning uh, it's not like food poisoning it is worse much worse well, anyways uh, it's it's a work uh, workable strategy it works in the sense that Santana is able to send in his army by about September of 29 and drive the 
and drive the folks out, drive the Spaniards out. Those who weren't sick and dead, he basically ran the others into the sea. He just let it work. Now, that's great strategy militarily. Politics are another story. Sometimes politics cannot uh, be beholden to military strategy. For the Mexican government, it was possibly the worst thing that they could have had done outside of outright defeat and disaster. What it does politically, this strategy of uh, let Vomito work its grisly magic upon the Spaniards, for uh, President Guerrero, Lorenzo de Zaval, and the Orquinos, it transfers authority and transfers uh, prestige from the presidential chair to Antonio Lopez de Santana and to the army. It's not unlike a historical analogy back in the, dark, in the distant past. Uh, in Rome, during one of the Roman Civil Wars, I believe it's the uh, first uh, Civil War of the Republic, but basically you've heard of Julius Caesar. He was a military man and he was a rebel, and he was trying to assume for himself dictatorial powers to one degree or another. One of the men who is opposing him and is at times a bit of a dictator himself, but he's also uh, a very good friend of the Senate, of the Roman Senate, is a man named Pompey. Pompey was a general. But Pompey is going to surround and put the squeeze on uh, Caesar, and it's it, you could almost make the comment, you could almost make the remark that Caesar had been outgeneraled by Pompey. Yet Pompey was squeezing Caesar, kind of like a boa constrictor, an anaconda does. He's squeezing him, and he's going to let it sit. Then Pompey comes to the conclusion, with the assistance and the advice of senators who were in the camp with him, they said, if you do not crush Caesar, then people will say it was the elements that broke Caesar, it was not Pompey, and you will not get credit for it, and we will lose prestige and power because of it. You have to break Caesar, you have to attack Caesar. Pompey did. Caesar won. And Caesar became... Caesar. Julius Caesar became Caesar. But the Mexicans didn't. And as those senators prophesied to, to Pompey, what they prophesied to Pompey came to pass in Mexico that the glory and the power of Guerrero and the government had ebbed away. That it wasn't the government's actions that really won the day. It was the little bug. It was the uh, it's the yellow fever that won the day and it beat the Mexican army. Guerrero's government's out of money. Yes, they repelled the invasion, but it was the bug that did it. Santana's a hero and Guerrero gets no credit. You know as well as I do what comes next and that is Guerrero is going to be forced out of office and he is going to be driven out and eventually Guerrero will be executed. Uh, Lorenzo de Zavala flees Mexico for a time. He will leave in exile. He survives and does not get executed. And so now you've got a centralist government in power. You may be asking what happens to Santana. He is t untouchable. There are, even in, in turbulent times, even in times where there's murder, and you can't see this from here, but there's a man uh, staring back at me at a poster in my office. His name is Joseph Stalin. Stalin hesitated to shoot or kill pretty much nobody, with one, one or two exceptions. Uh, Marshal Zhukov was one of the great heroes of the Soviet Union in World War II. Uh, he is going to be instrumental in the driving and the breaking of the German Wehrmacht. Uh, he is going to have so many medals that uh, when he was riding in the Great Victory Parade at, at uh, Moscow, uh, he had to have a iron girdle. Uh, I say it's a girdle. It's more of a, a, a whalebone, if you think of a corset sort of thing. To hold him up, he had so many medals on his chest. That Stalin couldn't touch him. He was that much of a hero. And so Stalin couldn't shoot him, though he would have liked to have had that done. So Stalin sends him to Central Asia and basically an outpost that breaks Zhukov's health. Santana is in a similar sort of vein. He is able to uh, retire gracefully as much as Santana can retire, and he goes back to being governor of Veracruz, the state of Veracruz, along the coast. And there he is to live out, uh, live for a while on his hacienda. And so he's out. Guerrero is gone, uh, meaning dead. Uh, Lorenzo de Zavala is back in. Lorenzo de Zavala is well. He's actually in the United States for a while and in Europe for a while as well. Zavala's out, and now the centralists come to power. 
and from about 1829 or 1830 actually to about 1832, so approximately two and a half years, it will be the centralist Escoceses who are going to run the show. And they have a different take on society. They think this ought to be influenced, that ought to be shut down, and on from there. I won't go through all the details except to say this. The man who is president of Mexico is Anastasio Bustamante. Anastasio or Anastasio Bustamante. So if you're watching this and you've got a copy of that uh, uh, Wikipedia up, you might pull him up and you can see the dates on there. That's accurate uh, and what have you. And the man behind the power, the man behind the throne with Bustamante is the fountainhead of the centralist or the Escocesis. And that is old um, Lucas Alamon. Lucas Alamon. I'm certain I mentioned him in class. And it's in this time period, it's important to remember, too, that as the centralists are consolidating power within themselves in Mexico City, they're doing it at the expense of the states. The states are being degraded in authority and power. Uh, it's, not, oh, it's not completely radical, but it's certainly noticeable. And on top of that, it's at the same time as the centralists are now in power, power and they are uh, adjudicating the situation, they are uh, judging the situation in Mexico. It is in this period of time where the law of April 6th of 1830 is going to be passed and put onto the books. And that, of course, as you recall, affects Texian immigration. So the Texians don't like the centralists. It directly affects them. There's there's taxes to be paid now that the Texians had not paid because of special exemptions. And this is kind of setting us up and coming to it. Antonio Lopez de Santana, and as we talked in the previous class, uh, we talked about this before, at least I think, uh, Santana depends on the class, I guess. I think I said this in one class, but not the other. But Santana, to make his way into power, yeah, I know I said this, uh, or rather I didn't. Santana, to make his way into power early on, is going to get with, uh, well, first of all, let me back up a second. He is a Caudillo. He is a, a pure-blooded Spaniard, that being Santana. During the Spanish Revolution, it's going to be the Mexican Revolution, and he, Santana, is going to be a royalist. He's going to fight in the Spanish Army. Uh, early on in his career in the Spanish Army, he, Santana, loved to gamble on anything in sight. He gambled on horse races. He gambled on cockfighting. I think it was he was well known to have some of the best fighting cocks in all of Mexico, fighting roosters. The fact of the mass matter is, is that he, well, just like a, a casino, uh, if the house... You know, if you go to the casino, some people certainly do win money. There has to be some people who win that creates the illusion of victory and the illusion of I could get rich, the something for nothing mentality. And some people do. But you know as well as I do, if everybody who comes from Vegas or Mississippi or Louisiana is saying, I won money and I won this, I won whatever, if everybody's winning, then the house has to be losing, and so that just doesn't make sense. That's not how gambling works. The house has to ultimately make money, and they often and they will make a lot of money because games aren't rigged. It's just against your odds in favor. So, uh, but, and, and Santana was a gambler, and so he went and forged, uh, he went and forged, well, checks on his superior officer's name when he was a young officer. This is about 18, 15, 18, 12, somewhere in that neighborhood. And he starts forging documents against his uh, superior officers and pays off his gambling debts that way. So that's number one. At the end of the Mexican Revolution, Santana is also going to be offered a promotion. One in the morning, he's going to be offered a promotion from I think it was a major to a, to a light colonel, lieutenant colonel, uh, and in the Spanish army because evidently it was right before the Plan de Iguala was going to come out, and they're trying to secure the loyalties of various officers and where you go. And up to this point in time, Santana had been a loyal Spanish subject. He'd been a loyal Spaniard. He'd been in the army, all that sort of stuff. And he says, "Sure, I love a promotion. I love the extra money. I love the extra." Uh, power and he's in the mid twenties at this point in time, and so by the time he, the afternoon rolls around, after he swore allegiance, he put his hand up, so to speak, and he swore allegiance to the Spanish crown once more. <coughs> the rebels come to Santana and say, "Would you like a promotion?" Well, yes, I would. What do you want to be? Well, I'll, you know, I'll be a, I like to be a colonel. Sure, you've got it. In the new Mexican army, you are a colonel. So that morning, he wakes up as a major becomes a lieutenant colonel before it's all said and done, flop sides completely, swears allegiance to anybody he needs to swear to, and becomes uh, a figure in Mexico. 
in the beginning, in the beginning of his term as a Mexican now, in the Mexican army, Santana has dropped his royalist tendencies and has said, I believe in Iterbi. Santana knows where the power is. And in that sense, he kind of, and this is probably not, <laughs> the man's going to roll over in his grave when I say this, but he kind of reminds me of Lyndon Johnson a little bit. Johnson knew where the power was wherever he went. That he was that sort of character. And John and they, uh, Santana was that way. He knew where the power was. And in 1822, Mexico, 1823, Mexico, that power is in Gustin de Iturbide. And so Iturbide is the power in Mexico. And so Santana says, "Hallelujah! We need emperors. That's what we need. We need royalists. We need we need uh, we need a man, to, a strong man to lead us." And Iturbide's the guy. To prove his loyalty to Iturbide, to kind of get in as close as he can. And one class has heard this, another the I don't think the other has. But old Santana is going to get extra friendly with Augustin de Iturbide's. Old, older sister. The older sister was 60 and Santana was 28. He, Santana, will bird dog her and chase after her uh, with about as much fervency and zeal as uh, Theodore Roosevelt chased after Alice Roosevelt. That's uh, an illusion from a 1302 class I just taught. The fact of the matter is, is that everybody could see through it, including Iterbidi. Uh, they said, by the way, that uh, the, the sister was a very beautiful woman at age 60, but it was obvious that Santana's interest was only the fact that she was related to the, uh, so close to the emperor. And that after 10 months of the emperorship of Iturbide, and he's about to be deposed, Santana, gauging correctly the winds that just shifted against Iturbide, threw his hands up and said, he is a tyrant, we must get rid of him, we must throw him out. And so he drops his pursuit of the, of the sister. He turns against Iturbide and becomes now the Federalist that I would referred to earlier. So Santana, this man who is a, uh, a character of characters, he is going to, by the way, invest in bubblegum. He's going to be a major investor in bubblegum. This fella is absolutely hard to believe. Hard to believe. Uh, in 1829, he's, he goes back quietly to his hacienda there he says he's gonna not do anything. He's not gonna take up arms unless Mexico's in trouble, blah blah blah. But in about 18, let me think here just a second, 31, uh, um, late 31, Santana is going to issue his own grito, his cry, his call to revolution. Santana issuing this cry, this call to revolution, is going to say, good Mexicans, follow me. I was a hero against the Spanish. I have saved the nation. I am a true Mexican. I am a true this and everything. And the government of Mexico City has destroyed the Constitution. It has destroyed the liberties of the Republic. Rally to my banner. Rally to my cause. We need a new revolution. And the only men Mark this down. The only men who rallied to his cause in 1831 were men who were already in Santana's army. Nobody else in Mexico rallied to Santana's cause. And that's the problem that Santana had, late 31, early 32, is, is that early on his call to arms, his cry for revolution was answered by only the men who were beholden to him. Nobody else in Mexico came after it. But if a major figure like Santana calls for revolution, you have to answer to it. If it's the difference between, it'd be like if I call for revolution with the United States, and of course I'm not, for those who are watching, especially since I'm about to publish this on YouTube, uh, but I'm not, no one would take me seriously because I'm a nobody. But if a powerful man in America said we need revolution, then people would pay really close attention. Again, that's a disclaimer. I probably shouldn't have even said that this day and age we live in. Uh, 
But uh, people might take it seriously if a powerful man did it. And in the case of Santana, he's a hero of Mexico, so you have to take it seriously. So the Mexican government sets a, uh, they send out the army to go quash, to, to break Santana and break his militia there at Veracruz. And to Santana's credit, when he is in crisis mode, when he is rushing to the defense, he is absolutely phenomenal and charismatic. He knows how to draw people to get and keep them together. So in that sense, Santana is doing a great job. So uh, anyway, so Santana uh, is holed up in Veracruz, and it's kind of a reverse of what happened in 1829. Santana is the man now in the city, but his men are not uh, going to get sick, basically, with vomito. Santana is in the city, yet the Mexican government is going to create a cordon, kind of a quarantine, around Veracruz, that coastal town, to kind of try to choke off and to stop Santana. Well, the government starts out okay. And this is always the case with these rickety Mexican governments. Sometimes it seems like they start out okay and then they dwindle off. Santana was able to not only uh, to survive, but here's the best part, and ridicule, mark this down sort of thing in politics. Uh, it's true in local politics, it's true in national politics. If you're being ridiculed and you can't answer the ridicule, or if it's just as obvious that the, it's the proverbial emperor has no clothes, you're done. You're done. And so, uh, oh, uh, Santana creates a ridiculing situation in the Mexican government. They're trying to capture him. They're trying to get him. Yet regularly, seemingly almost every night, Santana, who loved women, and I really mean this, he loved women a lot. He had a girlfriend who lived beyond the cordon. He lived beyond the quarantine. And so evidently, almost every evening or regularly, Santana would get on his trusty horse. You want to see what his trusty horse looks like? There you go. Santana got on his trusty horse, maybe with a couple of uh, his entourage, and Santana is going to ride through the Mexican lines and go visit his girlfriend and spend quality time with her if you catch my drift. And then he would ride back after spending that quality time and go back to Veracruz. And word gets out. This is the sort of thing, it's salacious, everybody finds it interesting, people are laughing. Oh my gosh, the government can't stop this man. And so what turned at first to be a look like a forlorn hope that the Mexican, that this uh, revolution, this grito, this cry to uh, revolution by Santana would be quashed because nobody took it seriously except for Santana and his immediate friends and, and men. The longer he survives, the longer the Mexican government can't quash him and uh, squash him, I guess you could say it's quash, squash, same difference. It's really not as close enough though. The fact of the matter is in this, not only the longer he, Santana, survives, but then you throw into the insult that Santana's with his girlfriend on a regular basis, people start to laugh at the government. And the government's moral authority is eroded and eroded quickly. Eventually, Santana is able to break free. And Santana returns to Mexico City, drives the centralist out, and now it's time for another set of elections in Mexico. 1832, now 33. And Santana, as you might expect, runs for president of Mexico. He runs for president of Mexico, and he's going to get elected. Mark this second man's name down. So Santana gets elected because he's the man of the hour. He's always kind of mercurial, and when he is on his game, he is as good as they come in Mexico. Charismatic, draws people to him. He alludes to the Romans, and he calls himself Cincinnatus. He is going to be the new George Washington, what have you. And the man who is running with, um, with, old, uh, with Santana is a fellow named, let me think here just a second, uh, Gomez... F Gomez Farias, yeah. Gomez Farias, F-A-R-I-A-S. Gomez Farias. And this is where the story of Santana's life becomes even more strange. Santana, just think of it this way, if, if Obama, President Obama had run for president in 2008, started running in 2007, had done mighty things and, and prominent things to get his name out there to the public, which he had done, of course, for years. And now in 2008, he runs in that great campaign of his, and he gets elected. 
And then at the last moment, he says and turns to his uh, vice president, Joe Biden, and says, you know what, Joe, I'm really tired. My health is bad. Joe, you're the man. Joe, go be pr acting president. I, I, I don't want the job. It's unheard of today. You would never see a man in a, in a country, at least I wouldn't think, but you would never see a man today who who went through the augers and went through the uh, through the toil the toil and the 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 trial of getting himself elected president, let alone a, a board of revolution? The fact of the matter is, he's now president, and at the at the moment of his maximum authority, the moment of him being granted the power, he comes up and says, "I'm sick. I don't feel good. I'm worn out. I want to just go back to my ranch. I'll give it to you, Gomez Farias. You're the man up." Why? Did he do it? Why did Santana do it? Uh, you know, realistically, we don't know. Was it some sort of master strategy by the madcap himself that says, all right, let's see how far federalism can push? Because Gomez Farias is a thoroughgoing, a true believing federalist. He is going to go after the major pillars of society and he's going to try to remake Mexico in a federalist image. Was that it? Perhaps. Is the fact of the matter, was it Santana's health was bad? He, Santana, was known for having horrible health at times. Uh, he, he just kind of was, uh, maybe, a, maybe he's a hypochondriac, I don't know. But my point is this, is that Santana is going to be, he, he, at the moment of maximum power, he walks away, and we really can't give a, I, I think an honest historian cannot give a good answer. I certainly can't. Why did he do it? Some say this, some say that, I don't know. Only he knew, and, and he may not have only known himself. Well, he goes away, and if you're looking at that Wikipedia page, you'll notice that there is Gomez Farias, then, then Santana, then Farias and Santana. It's almost like a ping pong ball going back and forth across the net. Long story short is, is that Farias, to his credit, Farias did not, was not going to mess up this opportunity. He had an opportunity to try to remake Mexico in his image and the Federalist image. And so Gomez Farias is going to go after three worthy opponents. Number one, he, Farius, goes after the army. Farius is going to try to remake the army, modernize the army, clean up the corruption in the army, and the army doesn't like it. Uh, truth be told, I, this is, I don't mean this in a, a relativist sense, but truth be told, one man's, uh, seemingly one man's corruption is another man's job another man's power. So the army goes traveling, if you can almost imagine, in camp out to the hacienda that Santana owned out in Veracruz and said, General Santana, President Santana, can you save us from this crazy guy, Farias? So Santana travels back to Mexico City, uh, spanks uh, Farias, takes back power, if you notice, it only lasts a few days, of maybe a week and a half, month, whatever, and then Farias is put back into power, and then Santana goes back to his ranch. Farias will also go after the church to try to divorce the church from some of the wealth and uh, the power that it had. And so the church sent a delegation out to Santana, who was sympathetic, and Santana removed the power from Farias once again, corrected him, and went back. And then last but not least, Farias went after some of the wealthy elite who also went out to uh, Santana's ranch and they were crying on his shoulder. And that's all that back and forth. There are multiple vi visitations. There's every nook and cranny. I, I really don't want to go through every part of it, but simply put, uh, the, the wealthy, the elite, the power in Mexico went to Santana and basically said, can you save us? And he said, I can he said also, he said, I will, I always want to take my sword and beat it into a plowshare, and I want to be like Rome's uh, Cincinnatus, to live on a ranch and not only be called off the ranch when uh, Mexico needs me. He always said that. He never seemed to be able to turn that sword completely into a plowshare. Well, Santana says, I can fix this situation, but you've got to give me the power. And by this point in time, the elites whether it's the church, the army, or the, the, the Criollos, are satisfied to give him the power. The, the federal experience in Mexico is now over, and that makes Santana the, uh, the real boss of Mexico. This is where he becomes the dictator. This is where he becomes El Presidente, the great Napoleon of the West. That's where, this is the Santana that you probably learned about in grade school. 
by the way, one other thing about Santana. Uh, I talk about the fact that he was uh, charismatic. Oh, yes, he was. And at times when he was right at the precipice of power, like we talked about uh, just a second ago, he get, gives it up. And then he it's even in battle, in battles against the United States and the battles of, for the Texas Revolution. You'll see Santana, when he should have been pressing his advantage, should have been on the attack. He becomes lazy and lethargic. He's a, he's a, a strange and unique character. Uh, but he does bleed from Mexico. Not only does he actually repel that invasion, he was personally valorous at times. At other times, you wonder what he was thinking. Uh, but uh, during the war with the United States, he is going to get it. No, excuse me, not the war with the United States. He, during the uh, uh, a second invasion attempt by the, uh, well, it was, I believe it was the French in this case, uh, he is out there on the battlefield, uh, and he's going to catch a cannonball in the leg, and it's going to take off the bottom part of his leg. And so he will have a prosthetic limb the rest of his life. And here's the rest of it. They're going to take that prosthetic. Well, his surgeon was not very good. And when they cut it off, they cut the bone off below the knee, uh, they left the bone a little proud. Just, and when I say proud like that. And so the surgeon, if you can imagine, stretches that skin and ties off and, and solders off below the leg. And that bone proud sticking through that, it's sticking on that skin. It never heals properly, and it will hurt him the rest of his life. So Santana, uh, maybe that's part of the reason why I had that laudanum issue later on. So uh, that's that. So now we've got Mexican politics effectively set up for the coming of the Texas Revolution. In the last few minutes of this uh, lecture today, I'm at 56 minutes. I'll probably call it off in a few minutes, so you know, you know what it is. In the coming of the Texas Revolution, I think the Texas Revolution begins not at Gonzales, but at Anahuac. Anahuac. And so, for our purposes now, the, the next famous name in Texas history now needs to show up. And that In your notes, and that man's name is William Barrett Travis. William Barrett Travis is not old. And one of the problems you get if you ever watch that John Wayne movie, give me a second, is, is that when you watch that John Wayne movie, you think that Travis is like 45. Travis at the Alamo was no more than 26 years of age, maybe closer to 25, but point is he's in his mid-20s. And when he, Travis, comes to Texas, he is a failed man. Just like so many of those men who come to Texas in our history, they are failed men. Uh, Houston, a failure at that point in the time he comes to Texas. Uh, Crockett run out of uh, political office and on from there. And you can tell just those two names pop up, but there are many men who come to Texas as failures. And Travis is one of them. Travis will be born in South Carolina in 1809. But um, by the time he's 18, this young man had his his you know, his hair's on fire, his pants on fire, whatever you want to say, this man's trying to make something of himself. He teaches school, and uh, he does stuff that today would have gotten himself thrown in jail. Uh, well, in the case of uh, Travis, he and one of his students, uh, a woman named, a girl named Rosanna Cato, are going to uh, evidently strike up a relationship, and Rosanna turns up pregnant. And uh, they're going to get married. It's going to be a tumultuous marriage, and it's just not very good for Travis or for Rosanna. There are plenty of examples where 18-year-olds getting married, and you know they live together and, and have harmony in marriage basically for 50 years. Then there are other times where two people get married at age 18, 19, uh, and it works out about like Travis and Rosanna's marriages. First kid was a was a boy named Charlie. We know that was uh, uh, that was Travis's. Uh, child. The second was a girl and she was maybe Travis's child, maybe not. Lots of speculation on that. William Barrett Travis is going to live in Clark County, Alabama, which is South Central uh, Alabama. He is going to be a school teacher. Later after he gets out of that business, he then becomes a lawyer. Uh, runs a newspaper st uh, stand and uh, you know he's, he's busy with a half dozen things. But he's not very successful. He's not very successful. He is a third string lawyer in a three lawyer town or county. He runs a newspaper and it's the third newspaper in a three newspaper town. And uh, the only good thing you can say about his time as a newspaper man was is that he learned how to write. 
I mean, he knew how to write before, but he really learned how to write now. In that, uh, if you're familiar thinking around, looking around the back of that uh, classroom uh, in Texas history, you know what I'm talking about. There's a letter from Travis back there, the great victory or death letter. It's uh, it's really one of the great hallmarks of, uh, of uh, Americana of history as far as writing and using the English language. He, he knew what he was doing there. But he was also an inveterate gambler. He gambled on anything and made, lost a ton of money. In addition to that, uh, he had debts from land speculations, from borrowing money, from gambling debts. You name it, he had his issues. And on top of that, he was a womanizer of the first order. That man got around the block more times than the ice cream truck. And it all comes crashing down on him in 1831, and he picks up stakes. And in the middle of the night, he leaves and runs out on his wife and runs out on his kid kids. He runs out on his debts and he basically absconds to Texas. He goes to Texas. GTT, gone to Texas. And so that puts him in Anahuac. And that's a good place to stop for today. One hour on the dot. I'm satisfied you've got a good information on the, uh, the rest of the Mexican Federal Republic. And now we can get the revolution taken care of by the end of the semester. You have a good day and we will see you on, uh, let's see, we'll see you on Thursday.